Hi and welcome. Today, I'm going to do a deep dive into Trump's criminal liability in the Georgia matter. By that, I mean Trump's phone call to Secretary of State Raffensperger after it was clear Trump lost the election in Georgia when he pressured Raffensperger to find the votes Trump needed to win. First, I'll talk about what makes a case like this difficult. Then, I'll talk about what can help the prosecution. Basically, I'm going to answer this question. What is taking so long with this? Is Trump going to get away with that phone call and now this letter? Okay, so the phone call. Several people were on the call. Headlines looked like this. Trump, in taped call, pressured Georgia official to find votes to overturn election. The president vaguely warned of criminal offense as he pressured Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger in the call, according to an audio recording. A few weeks after this phone call, the newly elected prosecutor in Fulton County, Georgia, opened a criminal inquiry into such attempts to influence the Georgia election. Raffensperger is cooperating with the investigation. Then, on September 17, two days ago, Trump sent a letter to Raffensperger asking him to check into proven voter fraud. Okay, part one, what makes his case hard? For someone to be prosecuted, there has to be a specific statute on the books, and the prosecutor has to prove each element of the offense beyond a reasonable doubt. This is a high standard. One question is whether Trump violated Georgia Code 212604. Under this statute, a person commits the offense of criminal solicitation to commit election fraud when, with intent that another person engage in conduct constituting a felony under this article, he or she solicits, requests, commands, importunes, or otherwise attempts to cause the other person to engage in such conduct. On the face of it, Trump did just that. Here's why it's not so easy. Trump is a master at muddying the waters and saying so many contradictory things that nothing can be pinned on him. For example, during the phone call, he said this, so we spent a lot of time on this, and if we could just go over some of the numbers, I think it's pretty clear that we won. We won very substantially in Georgia. He also asked Raffensperger to recalculate the votes. Now, if Trump genuinely believed he won the election, then asking Raffensperger to find legal votes to simply recalculate would not be a crime. So in his ramblings, Trump said things like this. We think that if you check the signatures, a real check of the signatures going back in Fulton County, you'll find at least a couple of hundred thousand of forged signatures of people who have been forged. And we're quite sure that's going to happen. Yes, Trump hinted that Raffensperger could face criminal consequences, but the threat was vague. Trump said this, and you're going to find that they are corrupt ballots, which is totally illegal. It is more illegal for you than it is for them because you know they did it and you're not reporting it. That's a criminal, that's a criminal offense. So it was a threat, but it could also be read as Trump saying, if you let people cheat, that's criminal. See the problem? This is exactly what mob bosses do. They're careful with what they say so that nothing can be pinned on them. Ruth Ben Gatt in her book on strongmen says this is exactly what people like Trump do. From Mussolini onward, making sure you have immunity while those who have done your dirty work go to jail has been an essential skill of strongmen. Now, let's look at the letter he wrote this week. Trump opens by saying that large-scale voter fraud continues to be reported in Georgia. He tells Raffensperger that people do not understand why you and Governor Brian Kemp adamantly refuse to acknowledge the now-proven facts. He asks Raffensperger to begin the process of decertifying the election. He concludes by saying the truth must come out. On one hand, the letter helps the prosecution because there's no legal process by which the election can be decertified. Trump is therefore asking Raffensperger to do something illegal. On the other hand, the letter could be read as Trump genuinely believing there was fraud, so he didn't intend to ask Raffensperger to do anything illegal. A jury's job in this case is to resolve the factual issue. Did Trump intend to pressure Raffensperger into an illegal act? I don't think there's any doubt that Trump did try to pressure Raffensperger into declaring him the winner. 
Whether a crime can be proven beyond a reasonable doubt is first up to the prosecutor, and then, if the prosecutor decides to bring charges, it will be up to the jury. And juries don't always do what we'd like them to do. This brings me to part two, what can help. Intention can be proven with circumstantial evidence. Evidence of a person's habit and practice can be used to prove intent on a particular occasion. In other words, the prosecutor can enter evidence of Trump's general habit and practice to prove what he intended during that specific phone call with Raffensperger. Michael Cohen, Donald Trump's longtime personal lawyer, testified under oath before Congress about how Trump signals the lies people are supposed to tell. Mr. Trump did not directly tell me to lie to Congress, Cohen testified. That's not how he operates. So how does he operate? Michael Cohen offered a few examples. In one example, during the campaign, while Cohen was negotiating with Russia on Trump's behalf to build Trump Tower Moscow, Trump often asked Cohen how the negotiations were going. Other times, Trump looked Cohen in the eye and said, there's no business in Russia. Afterwards, Trump went out and told the American people that he had no business in Russia. Cohen thus understood that there's no business in Russia was the lie he was supposed to tell. Andrew McCabe tells a similar story. After Trump fired Comey, Trump summoned McCabe to a meeting. Trump offered a gleeful description of what happened with the firing of Comey. McCabe knew it wasn't true. McCabe also knew Trump expected him to adopt this falsehood. McCabe refused. He said, no, sir, that's not true. He knew he'd given the wrong answer. McCabe knew he would lose his job because of his unwillingness to tell the lie that Trump wanted him to tell. And finally, the most well-known example of how Trump subtly, or not so subtly, uses these oblique strong-arm tactics is when he told President Zelensky that he needed Zelensky to do him a favor, though, by launching an investigation into the son of Trump's political rival. Zelensky got the message. In fact, all these recipients got the message. But you can see it's still difficult to prove intent from the evidence that we have. It can be done, but particularly in high-profile cases, prosecutors like the cases to be airtight. And the investigation is still going on. This week, the Fulton County District Attorney told reporters, What I can tell you is that the Trump investigation is ongoing. As a district attorney, I do not have the right to look the other way on any crime that may have happened in my jurisdiction. We have a team of lawyers that's dedicated to that, but my number one priority is to make sure that we keep violent offenders off the street. In other words, she has her hands full, but the investigation is proceeding. What are they doing? According to recent reporting, they're quietly conducting interviews, collecting documents, and working to build a line of communication with congressional investigators as they aim to build a case against Trump for his attempts to overturn election results. It should be obvious why they need to do this. Imagine charging Trump with a crime and then having the jury return an acquittal because the jurors have reasonable doubt. Not only would that embarrass the prosecution, but wouldn't that vindicate Trump more than not being charged at all? It's important that prosecutors gather all the evidence they can possibly gather before deciding whether or not they think they can prove the charges beyond a reasonable doubt.